told you I did it out there. I'm sure I've done it in the car. Just don't be the person that everyone turns around and goes in the middle of the thing. Okay, now on to the presentation. Um, tonight, I'd like to welcome Gregory Marks, a PhD student and sessional tutor in English and Creative Writing at La Trobe University. His thesis is on the Gothic narratives and post-human futures of Thomas Pynchon novels. And you can find him online at thewastedworld.wordpress.com and on Twitter at The Wasted World. You know, at, as in, not at The Wasted... Anyway, you guys. Okay. So Gregory's paper for this evening is entitled The Aesthetics of the Post-Human Gothic. He writes, Extinction is no longer news. Everywhere stories abound of a humanity on the brink of collapse. But what, if anything, are we to become after the destabilising shocks of technological transformation and ecological disaster? The answers to this question may point to a strange and unknown future, but the terms by which we imagine it... Sorry, the light. <laughs> but the terms by which we imagine it are far older than we may suspect. In this paper, Marx contends that the cybernetic and ecological disruptions of the human subject, producing what has been dubbed a post-human subject, are best imagined through the lens of Gothic genre conventions. Following Eve Sedgwick's schematization of the Gothic as a conflict between what's inside, what's outside, and what separates them, he argues that the Gothic structure of fragile interiors under siege from a dangerous outside is isomorphic to the anxious position of the post-human subject whose unstable human interior is beset on all sides by the vast outsides of nature and machinery. His paper tracks the transition from the traditional Gothic form to a properly post-human Gothicism by way of literature and media emblematic of a series of key aesthetic categories. Moving away from the relatively stable inside-outside divisions of the uncanny and sublime, the post-human Gothic emphasis on weird intrusions and eerie agencies charts the fault lines of a humanity in decay. The injection of the Gothic element into the post-human turns it away from the affirmative and vitalist commitments typical of the field towards themes of monstrosity, spectrality and extinction. Far from being a thing of the past, the Gothic genre's mixed joys and horrors in the face of disillusion are crucial to understanding the post-human existences which grow around us. Please welcome Gregory Marks. Thank you. Um, so firstly I'd like to thank um, the Cultural Inquiry uh, Research Group for having me here today and for organising these talks. Um, I'd especially like to thank uh, Ben for getting in touch with me uh, about presenting and uh, giving contact to organising this sort of thing. Um, As is often the case with these sorts of things, uh, my abstract for this paper was perhaps too abstract and some elements of it have been sidelined in the actual writing of the paper. Uh, to keep to the time limit while still doing the present topic justice, I've had to scrap the proposed discussion of the uncanny and the weird, uh, about which I'd be happy to elaborate uh, during the questions. Uh, with this in mind, I'd like to begin with a new and far more informative title for this talk, uh, Into a Silent Universe, The Sublime and the Eerie in Byron and Ballard. Extinction is no longer news. Everywhere stories abound of a humanity on the brink of collapse, no longer relegated to the distant reaches of deep time or the arcane will of a deity. The end of humanity is now increasingly lived and felt as an ongoing process. The countdown to global tipping points are not measured in the millions or billions of years, but by the decade. And even as the time scale of catastrophe contracts to the span of a human life, the masses of processes, actors, and systems leading into this disaster become inconceivably more complex. In the words of the philosopher of horror, Eugene Thacker, the world is increasingly unthinkable, a world of planetary disasters, emerging pandemics, tectonic shifts, strange weather, oil-drenched seascapes, and the furtive, always looming threat of extinction. To confront this idea is to confront an absolute limit to our ability to comprehend the world in which we live and of which we are a part. 
The future, we are told, is not human but post-human, which is to say that we will no longer be able to recognise ourselves as ourselves as we drift further into a global order of ecological disaster. As N. Catherine Hales declares, if human essence is freedom from the wills of others, the post-human is post, not because it is necessarily unfree, but because there is no a priori way to identify a self-will that can be clearly distinguished from another will. In other words, we realise that the human subject was never truly separate from the material processes relegated to the exterior of humanity. And as the world outside ourselves becomes unthinkable, so too do we become indistinct within the background noise. Despite seeing archaicism in the face of a post-human future, I contend that the genre conventions of the Gothic and its formula of negative aesthetics are best suited to making sense of the catastrophe and decay which characterise that future. Just as the post-human subject is structured around the human interior's loss of autonomy from what lies outside, Gothic fiction follows what Eve Sedgwick has identified as a particular spatial model, structured around the tensions of fragile uh, interiors and the siege from dangerous and desirable outsides. This model of the Gothic as a conflict between what's inside, what's outside, and what separates them, thus lends itself well to depicting the anxious position of the, the post-human subject, whose unstable human interior is infiltrated and overpowered by the vast outsides of nature and machinery. To, to elaborate upon this intersection of the Gothic and the post-human, I will closely at a pair of aesthetic categories typical of the Gothic, namely the sublime and the eerie, to locate within the Gothic style a nascent sense of post-humanity. At its simplest, the sublime may, may be defined as the experience of that which overwhelms the self with the idea of an overwhelming power. In our confrontation with that thing which utterly surpasses us, our mental faculties are pushed into a mad scramble to comprehend what is before us. In this state of confusion, the sublime is constituted as a contradiction experience between the demands of reason and the power of imagination, confronted with its limits by something which goes beyond it in all respects. The goal of the sublime experience is then to surpass the limits of comprehension, as it forces us to reckon with that which lies outside ourselves, and which floods the mind and senses with the unrepresentable features of subjectivity and reality. How exactly this reckoning occurs, however, is not constant throughout the various uh, historical manifestations of the sublime. For this reason, my discussion of the sublime will pass through three of its historical phases, namely the Romantic, the Gothic, and the Postmodern, assessing the state of the human subject and human reason within each. The persistence of the sublime over the past 300 years, I argue, indicates a core of Gothic aesthetics within the heart of modernity, which in every incarnation also speaks to the imagination of extinction that haunts the modern world. The second aesthetic category of this paper, the eerie, is comparatively under-theorised, but is nonetheless an essential component in the formulation of a properly post-human aesthetics. Both the sublime and the eerie, I argue, are by their association with non-human and inhuman modes of cognition and perception, explicit attempts to bring the power of what lies outside the human to the core of aesthetics. This transition from the romantic sublime to the gothic and from the uh, postmodern sublime to the eerie will be tracked through the analysis of two apocalyptic texts by Lord Byron and J.G. Ballard. In his seminal work on the romantic sublime, Thomas Weiskel proposes that the essential claim of the sublime is that man can, in feeling and in speech, transcend the human. Although what, if anything, lies beyond the human, God or the gods, the demon or nature, is a matter for disagreement. In short, the romantic sublime functions as an aesthetic apotheosis, which draws the human mind upwards toward those things beyond itself. If, in this the language of transcendence, we detect premonitions of current transhumanist claims about the supersession of humanity in a technological sublime. We should not mistake it for the basis of a truly post-human aesthetics. 
The sublime in its romantic form compels the human mind to rise above itself, but not necessarily to become something other than itself. In the romantic sublime, the observer experiences, in Kant's terms, a momentary inhibition, which redoubles the powers of the mind upon their return to order. This dynamic may be found in the most typically sublime of romantic poetry, such as Mont Blanc by Percy Shelley, in which the poet proclaims the majesty of the everlasting universe of things, which flows through the mind and governs thought. In the experience of Mont Blanc's sublimity, uh, picture here, Shelley uh, finds himself made subject to it, an epiphenomenon of an enormous and non-human power. In this moment, nature takes its place as sovereign of thought, but only for that moment. At the poem's end, when the sublime feeling crashes down from its crescendo, the perspective returns from the natural to the human, and the final question is posed to the mountain itself. What were thou, and earth, and stars, and sea, if to the human mind's imaginings, silence and solitude were vacancy? As much as the romantic sublime decenters the human subject from its place of mastery, it depends upon it to ground the aesthetic experience. In Weiskel's terms, the sublime response saves our humanity from humiliation by incorporating a vast and threatening outside back into the bounds of the human subject in the form of a challenge to be overcome. The sublime in this sense contains a moment of contemplation of a world outside us and without us, which is then returned to a human perspective with the spoilers. For all its language of transcending the human, the romantic sublime ultimately reverts back to a sort of aesthetic tourism, which guides us in an awed state through the realms of the non-human and superhuman only to return us safely to where we began, the human subject in all its mastery. If the romantic sublime is essentially a limited sublime, which presents the enormity of nature as something to be imaginatively and intellectually conquered, what form might the sublime take in the failure of this conquest? Having admitted with Shelley that there exists a secret strength of things which governs thought, we venture nearer to a Gothic sublime which eschews the primacy of human reason altogether. As Vijay Mishra has argued, while the romantic sublime finally has the triumphant human subject, the Gothic sublime is the voice from the crypt that questions the power of reason and destabilizes the centrality of the ego. Although Weiskel is right to claim that a humanist sublime is an oxymoron, only in the romantic form is this true for reasons of transcendence. As we shall see, there is in the Gothic sublime a crucial turn from the anthropocentrism of the romantic sublime toward the dark powers of the non-human world. Perhaps the cruelest instance of this Gothic sublime and its vision of an unthinkable world is found in Lord Byron's poem, Darkness. The poem recounts a vision of an earth submerged into the inky void of space by the sudden flickering out of the sun. Byron describes his vision like so. I had a dream which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished and the stars did wander darkling in the eternal space. Rayless and pathless and, and the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. Here the sublime works not by transcendence but by privation. And throughout the poem, negative epithets are bound to subtract from the rayless universe and pathless planet all qualities except the endless dark. Without direction, the earth spins off among the stars, but without sight, this vertigo remains strangely still. We may return here to Eve Sedgwick's spatial formulation of the Gothic and the parallelism she identifies in Gothic fiction between dreams and imprisonment or the almost inextricable association of depth with sleep and dreaming. The Gothic nightmare, located by Sedgwick in De Quincey's Opium Dreams, Maturin's Nest in the Narratives, and the trope of live burial, is one of privation and immobilization, the experience of submergence under a massive space, and the forced enclosure within an ever-shrinking interior space. 
In Byron 2, the darkness which surrounds the dreamer is not so much an empty or inert <coughs> space, but a force unto itself, which squeezes down and layers darkness, layers darkness upon darkness to smother all light. Byron's apocalypse confronts us with a universe in which disaster is not recompensed with transcendence, but only leads the, the human subject into the abyss as it faces the full consequences of the failure to transcend. Reversing the romantic formula in which the sublime outside is made an aesthetic object of the human subject, all of humanity here is assumed back into the earth. The world was void, the populace and the powerful was a lump, seasonless, herbless, manless, lifeless, a lump of death, a chaos of hard clay. In terms which anticipate the desolate flatness of the postmodern sublime, the Gothic sublime is progressively emptied of meaning, as all life slowly returns back to the mute matter from which it first emerged. In Mishra's words, the Gothic sublime gestures toward a world and its symbolic forms that are exhausted. Reality becomes a dream, realist representations a nightmare. Even the narrative structure itself is transgressed upon by this creeping void, as the dream, which is not all a dream, blurs the boundaries between the reality of the poet and the supposedly ontologically inferior world of the vision. In a sense, this confusion of fictional hierarchies is the catastrophe of Byron's poem, which in its qualified acceptance of the version of the world represented in the dream, enacts the disappearance of the human subject which it describes. But still, something remains and sets a final watch over Byron's silent universe. Lacking the independent human subject of the romantic sublime, and without recourse to the divine presence of yet earlier instances of the sublime, the Gothic sublime remain, uh, retains only a reverence for the void, an awe at the numinous absence where God or man once resided. Martin Bidney has remarked that Byron's epiphanies exhibit a covert identification with the seer's gender opposite, a deep sympathy with the dark sea-like feminine. For all its empty quietude, something elusive lurks within the darkness, which seduces the poet and draws him deeper into its midst. In the final lines of the poem, when all the earth lies dead, a face emerges from the darkness to reveal the being that had ruled its annihilation. The waves were dead, the tides were in their grave, the moon their mistress had expired before, the winds were withered in the stagnant air, and the clouds perished. The darkness had no need of aid from them. She was the universe. This personification of darkness need not be mistaken for a latent anthropomorphism. Instead, by granting a formless nature the cruel visage of a goddess, Byron raises further questions about this dark agency. Who or what is this thing? What does she want if she wants? Perhaps more pressingly, by giving this question of agency by leaving this question of agency until the final lines of the poem, Byron does nothing to explain the preceding events. Beyond the sublime's ultimately pleasurable play with the imperceptible, the darkness of Byron's poem takes on the subtle and uncertain qualities of the eerie, which indicates the workings of some hidden agency while explaining nothing of its nature. To elaborate upon the aesthetics of the eerie, we shall pass through another intermediate phase of the sublime and move from Byron's uh, darkened apocalypse to another, no less cryptic depiction of the world's end. In J.G. Ballard's The Crystal World, a colonial doctor ventures into the forest of the Congo in search of a lost lover, only to discover a leak in time, slowly transforming the jungle and its inhabitants into prismatic stone. Ballard describes the Doctor's first sight of the crystal forest like so. The long arc of trees hanging over the water seem to drip and glitter with myriads of prisms, as if the whole scene were being reproduced by some overactive technicolor process. The sky was clear and motionless, the sunlight shining uninterruptedly upon this magnetic shore, and now and then a stir of wind crossed the water and the scene erupted into cascades of color 
It rippled away into the air around them. Then the coruscation subsided, and the images of the individual trees reappeared, each sheathed in its armour of light, foliage glowing as if loaded with deliquescing jewels. A deathly quiet descends on the jungle, as the bustle of life is emptied of substance, locked in a frozen moment, a world trapped in amber. In this description, there is much of the sublime, but no longer in its romantic or gothic forms. This technicolour process, which reduces the jungle to images dancing across refractive surfaces, recalls Frederick Jameson's description of the postmodern sublime, whereby the world loses its depth and threatens to become a glossy skin, a stereoscopic illusion, a rush of filmic images without density. For Jameson, the postmodern sublime speaks to the eclipse of nature as the primary and determining outside of human experience, upon which all prior forms of the sublime depended. In the place of nature, the sublime object becomes the massive and unimaginably complex machinery of global capitalism, which turns back on and against us in unrecognisable forms and seems to constitute the massive dystopian horizon of our collective as well as our individual praxis. Like Ballard's Congo, the world of the postmodern sublime is flattened out, inexplicably transforming tangible things and accountable injustices into images without discernible origin or reality. The postmodern sublime is thus the aesthetic of the political thriller and the cyberpunk tale, in which something colossal but intangible shapes us, our desires, the scope of our imaginations, all the while remaining impossible to represent outside of fragments and conspiracy theory. Where this experience of the postmodern sublime lapses into the eerie, however, is the question of agency. What power is at work beneath the shallow surfaces of this new world? Like the postmodern sublime, the eerie hinges on the occlusion of agency and the speculation that follows the failure to discern a single guiding hand behind events. The aesthetics of the eerie, in the words of Mark Fisher, are constituted by um, a failure of absence or a failure of presence. The sensation of the eerie occurs either when there is something present where there should be nothing, or there is nothing present where there should be something. One of the more conducive environments to this eerie failure of apprehension is the empty landscape and the abandoned ruin. From out of the Congolese jungle, an enormous patch of ice uh, begins to spread. But without any confor uh, conformity with the known laws of physics, such an anomaly, like the zone of the Strugatsky's roadside like picnic or the planet of Tarkovsky's Solaris, constitutes a failure of absence in its inexplicable intrusion upon our world. Something is there which should not be. And a failure of presence in its refusal to give away any determining agency behind it if there is any agency at all. The eeriness of Ballard's novel hinges on this paucity of information concerning the causes of the crystal growth. Watching the contaminated zone spread daily, the characters attribute to it all manner of explanations, from the scientific to the theological. A physicist posits that it is a growing rift in the laws of the universe, as if a sequence of displaced but identical images of the same object were being produced by refraction through a prism, but with the element of time replacing the role of light. Later, the possibility of anti-time is introduced, against which our own time is slowly depleted. As more and more time leaks away, the process of supersaturation continues, the original atoms and molecules producing spatial replicas of themselves, uh, substance without mass in an attempt to increase their foothold upon existence. As in Byron's darkness, this spectre of extinction attains cosmic proportions, with crystal zones scattered across the earth and even spotted spreading across the sun. Without that single sublime moment in which the terror of unknowing is paid back in full, the emptiness of the eerie lets the mind spiral away from itself toward explanations both sacred and profane. In his introduction to the novel, Robert McFarlane suggests 
that the crystals may be read as a manifestation of capital, a fiscal rather than a physical precipitation, whereby all things are rendered fungible. Suggestively, Mark Fisher has argued that capital is itself an eerie agency, which, conjured out of nothing, nevertheless exerts more influence than any allegedly substantial entity. As the crystal forest spreads in the diamond mines of the Congo to the beachfront properties of Miami and, prophetically, the Pripyat marshes, it precipitates value, turning dead time into objects. Such a reading recalls Jameson's formulation of the postmodern sublime as the incomplete, incomplete attempt to grasp capital's increasingly diffuse and invasive structures, but remains well within the domain of the eerie in the fact that Ballard's crystal zones accumulate possible agents without ever arriving at a sensible end to the speculation. In the crystal jungle, a priest watches over the remains of his parish to preach the manifestation of eternity on earth and the final transubstantiation of all flesh into everlasting light. He declares, here everything is transfigured and illuminated, joined together in the last marriage of space and time. Although communicated in the register of religious zeal, the priest's sermons speak to an utterly alien and inhuman salvation. This apostle of the prismatic sun proclaims that in the forest, the transfiguration of all living and inanimate forms occurs before our eyes. The gift of immortality, a direct consequence of the surrender by each of us of our own physical and temporal identities. In this surrender of the self to an impossibly vast outside, the eerie is revealed as a species of sublime experience, but one in which the centrality of the human in either its triumphant empty or fragmented forms has been eschewed altogether. The eerie object constantly eludes our perception, let alone our cognition, because it is something utterly outside the human and is detected only in its strange effects upon the world. If we drown in the sublime, we suffocate in the eerie. Where previous forms of the sublime retain a place for the human subject, the eerie, as a kind of post-human sublime, is capable of communicating an aesthetics of a world without us. Further still, when placed in the middle of a mute nature that lacks even the capacity for indifference, we ourselves become harbingers of the eerie. If the world outside is governed by nothing but a dead bumbling of cause and effect, lacking any designing or purpose of intelligence, then what are we? Are we the agents of our own actions, and for how long? In this way, the eerie places us outside ourselves in a moment of speculation that both devastates and recomposes the group. In his theorization of the Gothic sublime, Vijay Mishra sees it as a prefiguration of the postmodern sublime as a sublimity without recourse to humanity. Although while the Gothic sublime is constructed around unknowable depths, the postmodern sublime is far more concerned with the perfidy of surfaces. If the romantic and Gothic sublimes mark encounters with an immense natural outside in either a conquering or submissive form, then the postmodern sublime is the experience of obstruction when we fail to grasp the totality of capital's global system. The shining surfaces of the postmodern sublime, like the fractal shapes of Ballard's novel, both obscure the machinery which brings them into being and reduces all else into images which flitter across the screen. In continuation from the Gothic and postmodern sublimes, the eerie, as defined by Mark Fisher, may be identified as a species of post-human sublime. By adopting the inhuman perspective of the Gothic sublime, the eerie decenters our experience from the human interior and redirects it toward the hidden, agential depths of the non-human world. Additionally, by taking the aesthetic reduction of the post-human sublime one step further, the eerie transforms the human subject into an image trapped in glass, composed by something other than itself. Moving from the romantic sublime through its gothic and postmodern successes, and arriving finally at an eerie post-human sublime, 
We move closer to an aesthetics which can see the human inside from the perspective of the inhuman outside. The successive forms of the sublime function increasingly by what Heather Davis calls the defamiliarization and derangement of sense perception typical of the post-human condition. Within the realm of post-human aesthetics, Davis writes, we experience the complete transformation of the sensations and qualities of the world. In other words, the world that we are born into is receding in front of our eyes, causing a rearrangement of the sensory apparatus of our cognition, or, sorry, of our organism. Within this rearrangement of the senses, and by extension of ourselves, we discover nothing other than the mixed horrors and joys of the Gothic aesthetic. The main tasks of post-human theory, namely the, um, the folding of the exterior back into the interior, the placing of the inhuman ontologically before the human, and the conception of an aesthetics after human finitude, are for all their perceived novelty also the age-old pursuits of Gothic fiction. In this light, the archaisms and horrors of the Gothic are more than cheap scares or senseless nightmares. The Gothic imagination is also an escape from the parochialism of the merely human, the assumed right of man over his universe, and a way to think a world which will not wait for us and which does, which does not care for what we think or need. If the world is, increase, is becoming increasingly unthinkable, the barriers between ourselves and this world are increasingly blurred, we must confront the question of human extinction, the fact that humans um, will become extinct, the fact that we cause other extinctions, and also that we are extinguishing what renders us human. From its beginnings, the Gothic form has repeatedly returned to tales of humanity's dissolution and decay into an unthinkable universe. As we enter an era of globally unfolding catastrophe, it is the horror of the Gothic, which once again describes the limits of our existence and its terror, which may guide us to other ways of being. Thanks, everyone. subsidiary of the Gothic. Right. Um, the Gothic's traditionally divided into uh, horror and terror fiction with their own uh, conventions. Um, these days, horror tends to be its own genre as well, and terror has sort of branched off into mysteries and so on. Um, but, yeah, I'd say that it's... Definitely horror is, is able to be folded back into these sort of traditions of the Gothic. Right. Um, as opposed to being something entirely new or separate from it. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Nope. Um, thanks, Greg. Um, just curious, um, I mean, you bracketed out at the start, the uncanny. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious as how do you, distraw, uh, how you draw a distinction between uh, uncanny and eerie in regards to your paper? Um, yeah, so originally I wanted to use two pairs of uh, uh, traditional and post-human aesthetic uh, categories. So the uncanny, um, I would have put this to the sublime, the uncanny being um, in the sense of the, the Unheimlich is the, that sort of constant interiority and the fear of nested interiors. The, the sort of horrors that lurk within the home and within the sort of repressed self. Um, which I think would then be opposed to something like the eerie and the weird in that the, the weird and the eerie are concerned with outsides, with exteriors. Um, just as the sublime uh, always returns 
back to a human subject, uh, or at least in its romantic form, uh, returns back. Um, the uncanny ultimately doesn't have a sense of exteriority. If something shocks and it's uncanny, it's because it's the familiar made unfamiliar, mm -hmm. or it's the unfamiliarity lurking within the familiar. Mm -hmm. But we're ultimately never getting outside of ourselves, mm -hmm. and we're caught within this uh, sort of human psychology. Uh, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, no, like because I was going to mention something like the uncanny valley effect as well, which yeah, seems yeah. to rely on um, a clothe. Yeah, what you were calling the interior mm. kind of idea as well. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That clarifies yeah. things. Uh, thanks for the background, it's cool. Uh, there's, yeah, always want to touch down on several points, but mm -hmm. first one is give me a sound yet. Yeah, the second one is, uh, can you tell us where you were thinking of going with the weird, mm -hmm. and as a little of an adjunct to that, I know you're a Deleuze reader, mm -hmm. uh, how do you think something like uh, becoming imperceptible and becoming cosmic um, through Deleuze's reading of Lovecraft, um, which I'm just assuming you've touched on, but um, yeah, if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, um, so the weird, I, I also like the, the definition that Mark Fisher gives in his book, The Weird and the Eerie, where he sort of uh, couples them as concepts, where um, the weird is essentially a kind of, um, uh, he defines it as kind of like a, a montaging effect where there's something. Um, you know, there which shouldn't be, that comes from, you know, outside, something other than ourselves. Um, which, uh, as opposed to something like the eerie, where we're never entirely sure what the object we're perceiving is, the weird is always a, it's a confrontation. Um, yeah, and as far as uh, Deleuze goes, I don't really have any ideas off the top of my head. Um, I think. Some of these ideas of becoming imperceptible perhaps work well with the eerie, but um, no, I didn't really have that in mind when, when writing this. Um, I hope you talk about it later. Though, yeah. I'll, I'll, if you don't mind me trying it yeah, again. Yeah. Um, sorry, Chair. Uh, the reason I brought that up is because you've got the, uh, with the sublime, you've got you know, that constant challenge of limits. Um, limits of perception and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, becoming is obviously a technique that was uses to uh, stretch from the existence cosmically but also molecularly. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, like, there's definitely a lot in like Mark Fisher's definitions of the weird and the eerie, which I think um, like, he doesn't cite Deleuze, but he's obviously borrowing a lot from those sorts of readings of, of the coming and so on, in the way that um, the the weird and the eerie force us outside ourselves in that contact that um, sort of forces new becomings and new senses of, of oneself or loss of oneself even. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a great paper. Great, really enjoyed it. I thought it was really nice, like, genealogy of, like, the different sublimes and how they play out different years and stuff. And, but I guess I'm also interested in how this relates to, I know you're interested in like ecology and things like that, and how like this kind of decentering of the human in the kind of like the post-human like gothic um, kind of works with thinking through ecological like, kind of problems and ideas. Yeah. So obviously like the old idea of like being the caretaker of nature and like, pastoral kind of thinking kind of goes a bit out the window, right, with this kind of overcoming. So I'm just wondering like what your thoughts are. Just... Um, yeah, I think to some extent, um... Like, I'm not sure if you can really get a, like, a useful, like, political ecology out of something like this. Um, more than anything, I see it as representing a kind of growing ecological consciousness and sort of fears around these dangers. Um, whether, you know, whether you're reading someone like Timothy Morton, where the, the vision between nature and self is no longer viable, um, or, you know, I think other sort of more useful um, thinkers who will sort of um, chart how nature has been constructed as a sort of separate thing but um, incorporated into sort of material processes and so on. Um, yeah, more than anything, I think this is really sort of a cultural analysis and if anything, I think speaks to this need for um, like a coherent, uh, you know, 
political ecology that can actually make sense of these sorts of issues. I think the, the eerie and the sublime are essentially attempts to tackle um, a vast nature. And the forms of the sublime generally, I don't think they get us far enough because it reduces nature and these sort of vast material systems to aesthetic objects. Mm -hmm. um, but in the year we find the aesthetic object speaks back mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and we find ourselves made objects of, of within much vaster systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I recall a previous paper that you worked with, Rancière, um,